Welcome to section five. In this section, we're going to talk about different types of t-tests. Specifically, in this section, we're going to begin by discussing the independent samples t-test. We'll talk about its theory and also its assumptions. After that, we're going to go through an example of how to do an independent samples t-test. Once we've completed that, we're going to talk about the paired samples t-test. Again, we'll begin by talking about its theory and its assumptions, and after that, we'll go through an example. And finally, we're going to talk about how to visually represent the results of these different types of tests by creating some error bar charts. In this video, we're going to talk about the independent samples t-test, and specifically, we're going to talk about its theory and its assumptions. In this video, what we're going to do is we're going to start off by talking about the purpose of the independent samples t-test. From there, we'll move on and talk about the hypotheses for the independent samples t-test, and then we're going to talk about the theories and formulas behind this test. Finally, we're going to talk about the assumptions of the independent samples t-test. When it comes to the purpose of the independent samples t-test, the purpose is really to test whether the means of two different groups differ significantly from each other. And we're going to compare these two groups. They have to be completely separate groups. It can't be a before and after design by where you're assessing the same people. These groups have to be completely different and you're going to be comparing these groups on some continuous outcome variable. For example, you may be comparing females and males on income, for example. Now, what we're going to do with this independent samples t-test is we're going to determine if there's a difference between these two groups. You know, are these groups the same or are they similar on some measure? Now, in terms of hypotheses, where that leaves us is, as usual, there are two hypotheses. The null hypothesis is basically saying that there are, the means of the two groups will be the same. Okay, and then the alternative or the research hypothesis is that the means of the two groups will differ from each other. So in other words, going back to that example of comparing females and males on income, the null hypothesis would be saying that females and males are making the same amount of income. Whereas the alternative hypothesis would be that the two groups differ on income. One group is making more or less income than the other. In terms of just theories and formulas, the basics of what we need for an independent samples t-test, again, is we have an independent variable that's going to be categorical. In this particular example, we have gender, and then we have a continuous dependent variable. In this case, it's going to be math score. And really what we're going to do is we're going to compare the mean of one group with the mean of the other group. In terms of what this looks like as a formula, you can see that your t-score is going to be equal to the mean of group one minus the mean of group two. So it's going to be the 66 minus the 84 in this example. And then what we're doing is not only are we taking the, into account the means of the groups, but we're also taking into account the number of cases and the variation. And so we take those means and we divide it by the square root of your standard deviation squared, and which is divided by the number of cases. Again, here's your formula for a standard deviation. And again, your standard deviation is just taking account, into account the amount of variation that you have within each group. So again, it's just really the score minus the mean. You end up squaring that, and then you end up summing that all up, and you divide by your degrees of freedom, the number of cases minus one, and then you take the square root of all of that. So that's going to give you your standard deviation. That's already calculated for us here. In fact, what this really looks like is, as I was mentioning earlier, we're taking the means of each one of these groups, and then we're dividing it by your standard deviation squared divided by your number of cases in each group. And then we take the square root of all of that. In this case, what we come up with is we come up with a t-score that's a negative, basically negative 2.5, all right? What we then do is we take that t-statistic, you can see that that was calculated here, and assess that T statistic on our degrees of freedom. Because again, there are a lot of different T distributions. We wanna make sure we use the right one. Degrees of freedom lets us know which T distribution to use. And you can see, for example, the way that degrees of freedom are calculated, it's the number of cases in group one plus the number of cases in group two minus two because there are two groups. So in this case, we saw earlier that there were a total of five people in each group. So we take five plus five minus two is eight degrees of freedom. So in terms of how we assess this value that we have is that's telling us the probability that the null hypothesis is true, the probability that there are no differences among those groups, the probability that this 66 and 84 are basically the same. We see that they're quite different, which is what this t-statistic is telling us. And when we assess that t-statistic, we see that the probability of the null hypothesis being true is really small. 
it's less than 0.05. So there's less than a 5% chance of the null hypothesis being true. Therefore, we reject the null hypothesis and we have no choice but to conclude that there is a relationship between gender and math scores. And in this case, we see that females had a higher math score than males. So that's all that's going on behind the independent samples t-test. Now, let's talk about the assumptions for this test. In order for this test to perform to its optimal level, we want to make sure we meet the assumptions. And the first is that we're only comparing two groups on a continuous dependent variable. OK, so we're comparing things like males and females on income, on SAT scores, whatever it happens to be. We may be comparing one marketing campaign to a second marketing campaign and in terms of number of sales that they end up producing and things like that. So again, we're only comparing two groups. We also have to have a dependent variable that's normally distributed, that we're meeting the assumption of normality. And it's within each one of these different groups. Now, again, going back to what we talked about earlier is we're looking at the distribution of the values within each one of these different categories. For example, the math scores of males, and we want to make sure that those scores are normally distributed. Now, what happens if they're not normally distributed? Well, if you have a large enough sample size, and by large enough, I mean there's at least 30 cases in each group, typically you're okay, even if your distribution is not normally distributed, but if it's positively skewed or negatively skewed, that really doesn't end up making that much of a difference, as long as both groups have the same general distribution. They're both positively skewed, they're both negatively skewed, and you have more than 30 cases in each group, you're typically okay. If one's positively skewed if one's, and the other one is negatively skewed, or if you have less than 30 cases in each group, then that's where you could run into some problems and there are other tests that you can use. The other way in which you can run into a problem is if you have these bimodal distributions. Why is that? Because what we're using is we're using the mean to represent each one of these different groups and clearly the mean is not representative of a bimodal distribution. So again, that's where you could run into some issues. But general, in general, the independent samples t-test is a pretty robust test. Again, as long as you have 30 cases in each group, typically you're okay. The final assumption is that you want to make sure that both groups have the same amount of variation. This is the assumption of homogeneity of variance. Now, why is that? Well, in this example, notice that the variation is your standard deviation, and they're exactly the same in each group, so we're not going to have a problem here. Now, why could it potentially be a problem? Well, let's take a look at the formula for your independent samples t-test. Look at what we're doing. Not only are we taking the means of each group, but then we're taking the standard deviation squared for group one, really plus the standard deviation of group two. So if the variation of one group is very different than the amount for the other, we end up pooling those variations together. And if they are different, then that pooled variation is going to be biased. And that's the problem. Now, how do we know if it's biased or not? Well, I skipped these two columns initially when we looked at the results of the independent samples t-test and this Levine's test of equality of variances, that is what assesses that assumption of homogeneity of variance. We have a statistic, it's on an F distribution. We'll talk about this dist distribution in another lesson. And remember, every statistical test has both a null and a research hypothesis. What's the null hypothesis? The null hypothesis is always that there is no difference, that there is no relationship. In this case, that the variances are the same, which is really what we want. The research hypothesis is the opposite, is that there is a difference, that there is a relationship. This is telling us the probability that the null hypothesis is correct. Notice that this value is very high. It's greater than 0.05. And again, what's our null hypothesis? That the variation is the same for the two groups. So ideally, what we want to see when we're assessing the assumption of homogeneity of variance is we want to see the significance value under this uh, Levine's test of equality of variances column. We want to see that value to be high, greater than 0.05. And what happens? If we've met that assumption, then that means we look at this first column, this first row. Equality of variance is assumed. We've met the assumption of homogeneity of variance. Then we end up taking a look at our results that we found in this first row. If we did not meet the assumption of homogeneity of variance, what do we do? Does it mean we can't do the test? No, it just means that we look at the bottom row. Equal variance is not assumed. Here we have not met that assumption and we end up taking a look at this information down below. 